the festival take place at Dutton Island Park Preserve, both the city and the uh, city of Olympia Beach and city of Jacksonville. So this is the poster. I've got some flyers on the table. Um, it gives you a little more information about it. But we'd love to see everybody there and just come out and have a good day. Thank you. And we would love to have some volunteers, too. So. <laughs> um, also want to remind everybody that we have opened up early bird uh, membership renewals for um, 2014. So um, our memberships, the Beaches Watch memberships, run from January to December. So um, regardless of when you join, whether it was May or September or whatever, the membership for 2014 starts in January. It's $10 for individuals and $15 for families. Um, so we have um, paperwork here if you want to renew your membership now, or you can do it online. We also are doing uh, nominations for the Give Back Donation, which is um, recognizing a local nonprofit that is enriching the quality of life for Beaches residents. And we will get that donation at our meeting in December. But we would love to have you um, submit sub nominations of a, a worthy nonprofit. Um, the deadline is November 15th, which is a week from Friday. So um, feel free to nominate uh, a, a nonprofit. We would love to uh, recognize something great that, that nonprofit, a nonprofit is doing in our community. And then also just want to mention that we are having elections at the December meeting, and we do have nominations for uh, Vice President. Sybil Ansbacher has been nominated to be Vice President, and so does Sybil, you wanna raise your hand? Sybil's so currently <laughs> on the board, uh, but she's, uh, she's uh, willing to step up into the Vice President position, and we're really happy about that. Uh, Cindy Funkhauser, uh, is uh, being nominated for our secretary position, so uh, we're, we're also very happy about that as well. And then Donna Leah Geltz is uh, being nominated for a director position, so we'll have um, elections in December to confirm the nominations. And uh, anyway, if, uh, if anybody uh, has any questions, we'd like to know a little bit more about the board, you can talk to uh, any of our board members. We've got uh, Kate Godwin, who's, wait, don't laugh, she's married, sorry. She's here. And then also Sybil is a current member of the board. And then Beth Kilgore is our treasurer. And uh, Jet, oh, behind the camera, she's, she's a member of our board. And Ed is currently vice president of the board. So um, we're always looking for new blood. And so if you'd like to talk to any of our board members, we would love for you to consider future service on the board. Um, and then just to let everybody know, our next meeting is going to be December 4th, and that's where we'll be doing the elections and the give back donations. So um, any other announcements that anyone has real quick before we move to our speaker? Yes? Just a couple of quick things. The, um November 16th is going to be a busy day. There's going to be a Celtic music festival at Latham Plaza in Jacksonville Beach uh, pretty much all day long. They'll have lots of bands, Scottish dancing, bagpipes, uh, demonstration of Scottish sports. If you're interested, they would love to sign you up to teach you how to throw a cable. Um, uh, are you wearing a skirt? Well, maybe. <laughs> they don't actually call them. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, killed. Um, the other thing is, the city of Jacksonville Beach is making a major effort this year to decorate the downtown area. The, down, the Downtown Business Men's Association is going to highlight the roof lines on all of the buildings downtown. For the holidays. Uh, various businesses are going to sponsor the decoration of lifeguard stands, and they're going to fill the Latham Plaza with decorated life. Uh, like lifeguard stands. If you're interested in participating on a personal basis, uh, they're going to decorate uh, street light poles along 3rd Street with lights and decorations. You can sponsor a street light pole for $150. You'll be recognized on the website and in the Jacksonville Beach Electric Authority's uh, monthly newsletter. So it would be a good way to remember a loved one or to show your community spirit by donating. Thank you, Jim. Jim is on the holiday decorations committee. 
Okay. All right. So thank you for thank you for the announcements. And now we'll uh, turn the floor over to our guest speaker tonight, who is Mr. Scott Dudley, and he is the legislative director with the Florida League of Cities. He's going to talk to us about. Um, legislative issues of importance to municipalities like our beaches um, that are going to be coming before the 2014 legislative body. So thank you, Scott. Thank you. We appreciate it. He came all the way from Tallahassee, so we're very honored to have him here. Association of all the municipalities in the state of Florida, 410 cities in the state, and about 2,400 elected officials from around the state. I've uh, got several of the local elected officials here. Thank you all for your uh, service. It's, uh, it, they're not doing it for the pay, I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I want to thank all of you too for your for your activism, for your concern, for even being here tonight. It, it, it matters. It really does. It's pretty cool. I actually get pretty excited. It's neat that we have a, a young man back here. He's in a civics class at, at one of the local schools, and it's pretty neat. I, when I was in, I guess, eighth or ninth grade, I took a class and I had a teacher turn me on to politics and to civics, and, and I've just been on fire for it ever since. And hopefully, you'll catch the book. It's pretty exciting stuff. It's neat. It's it's. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes it feels like it's completely dysfunctional, and other times you feel like, wow, we're actually making a difference, we're doing something, and the engagement of the citizens, it really does matter. In fact, that's why I think that at the local level and the state level that we're able to get more done, uh, because it's not in Washington, there's not that distance, uh, where they're up there just doing their thing and sort of forgetting about what's happening back at home, really, in a lot of ways. And uh, so, it's, it's pretty cool. And, uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, a little bit about myself. This will be my 28th session coming up. Uh, I've been lobbying for a long time. I have no other marketable skill. Uh, that's it. Uh, I have done public sector and private sector. Uh, I, far back as when Governor Childs was in office, I lobbied for him. But prior to that, I worked at a law firm doing private sector stuff. Interesting, one of the big issues with cities and this sort of inside baseball that uh, the Consultants Competitive Negotiation Act is a way of selecting architects and engineers. Cities hate the way it's selected now, but when I was in the private sector, I represented the architects, so I helped create that law that now the cities hate, and now my cities are trying to undo the law that I helped create, you know, 25 years ago or whatever, and so that's the way the circle goes. Um, and it is a bad law. I was young and foolish then. <laughs> I also want to thank you guys have, from, from this area, you all have a great legislative delegation. There's an awful lot of folks. We, at the League of Cities, um, our message is really, uh, it kind of reminds me, our message is, is basically kind of leave us alone, let us, let the local governments do what they, what they do. Uh, it reminds me, if you remember years ago, a couple of years ago, back in Gainesville, like, kid got arrested, he's like telling the police, don't tase me, bro. Well, that's sort of our message in Tallahassee is we're the, we're the don't tase us, bro crowd because we just want to be left alone. We want the local governments, we want the legislature to not impose unfunded mandates on us. We don't want the legislature to take away our home rule authority. We have constitutionally guaranteed home rule authority. We have legislatively, they back that up with some legislation. But unfortunately, they included an awful lot of ways that they can get around those unfunded mandates and the preemption of home rule, there's some criteria that they have to meet, some hurdles they have to jump. They're not really extremely high hurdles, unfortunately, and so um, they regularly like to take things into their own hand and take the rest, the control away from the local citizens and invest it in the powers of Tallahassee. And that's not really the best approach in our opinion. And, uh, that's what the League of Cities, that's what we're for. I will say that Joe's boss is pretty good with us, and she, she has a pretty good record with us, and has attended a number of our conferences, and has spoken to our panels, and is a good, uh, believes in home rule, and we appreciate that. And in fact, there are the, a lot of members of the delegation. I know Senator Thrasher, Senator Bradley, uh, there, you, you guys have some really good, uh, Senator Aaron Bean is also a really good uh, legislator for you guys. Uh, so 
you got a good delegation. They like hearing from you, so you need to make sure that you continue to weigh in with them. Um, how many of you have called your legislator on any on any number of issues? So, okay. Come on. Got to have 100 percent That's what it's all about. It's representative democracy. They can only they can only represent you if they hear from you. And uh, that's what it's really all about. So um, I'm gonna walk through some of the uh, oh, a little bit more about myself just to sort of finish that up. Uh, 28 years in the process, I have uh, three grown children, two grandkids, a six-year-old and a two-year-old, love them to death, love it, um, love being a grandparent, I get to give them back to my kids um, when the day is over or the weekend is over or whatever, and uh, big sports enthusiast, uh, bike, run, surf, whatever, lots of great memories here, these beaches around here, just uh, surfing and hanging out here, causing a little bit of trouble maybe. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, I... Uh, yeah, I'm an FSU fan, so I don't know if that's popular in these parts or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They're good. They're good. good. Some. For some of us. Um, <laughs> right now, but, you know. I've always been <laughs> <laughs> I've always been <laughs> <I've always laughs> <been laughs> getting more so, right? The bandwagon. There's plenty of room for them. Uh, I've always been an Oregon Duck fan, too. I, I used to work out there in one of my previous jobs. Go out to Oregon a lot. I'm like, yeah, it's cool uniforms and beautiful campus and all that kind of stuff. And now it's coming down to FSU versus the Oregon Ducks for the national championship. Maybe and I know I'm going to FSU and the Ducks can fly away. That's not the concern. So, um, so a little bit, a little bit about what's going to happen in this legislative session. I'm just going to try to hit the 50,000 foot view because we could get really into the weeds really fast on a lot of this stuff. Um, there is definitely going to be a push uh, in the House and the Senate dealing with water quality and water quantity. Uh, there's some money in the budget that has not been spent, that there uh, seems to be a surplus for there, there was. Uh, we'll see if that still holds out at the next uh, revenue estimating conference. Um, and there seems to be an awful lot of uh, issues. We've got the Indian River Lagoon issue where there's uh, just waters uh, flowing into the Caloosahatchee uh, from and into the, into the Indian River Lagoon and Lake Okeechobee. And then in North Florida, you have springs issues that are, that are causing problems. That there seems to be a general consensus in the legislature that they want to do something about water quality in the state of Florida. There's a recognition that water quality and water quantity, water supply issues, go hand in hand. You've got to sort of deal with them in unison. Uh, and so there's talk of trying to create uh, incentives, grants. Not really sure what it's going to look like. Maybe, maybe Joe, maybe you want to enlighten us and tell us what it's going look like yet? Um, actually, I haven't heard anything. General Flynn Tallahassee. Okay, I'll get a talking about it. Um, but uh, basically looking at trying to have money available for local governments to uh, and to uh, basically uh, update some of their infrastructure, their water infrastructure. We have pipes that are leaking, which is a part of the supply problem. If you've got water just leaking into the ground, that's supposed to be used for, uh, it's supposed to be potable water, not just leaking into the ground. That's a problem. Uh, reclaimed water, uh, trying to encourage the use of reclaimed water around the state, obviously not for drinking, but the more you use uh, reclaimed water, then that's less potable water that you have to pull out of the ground. Um, and everything, it's, this is one of the problems with Tallahassee is, and, and with, with policy in general, is that reclaimed water is great. The, less, the more you use, the less potable water, but reclaimed water is also high in nitrogen. So it's actually helping to contribute to some of those water quality problems. So everything's, all these, all these things are so linked together that it's really hard to start, once you start dealing with one of these issues, to not really open up and start, all right, well, we gotta look at that too. So we're looking at water quality and water quantity simultaneously. Um, the League of Cities, that's gonna be one of our priorities too. We want to see money come to local governments. We don't wanna see it go through, one of the problems is when the legislature gets money, they put it in a trust fund, and then if there's any down, <clears throat> downturn in the economy, they raid the trust funds, and when the money was intended to be used for, it doesn't get used for anymore. And that's just the way that they do business in Tallahassee. Um, uh, we hope we're trying to figure out a way that we can make that uh, money available, and that it's continually going to be available, that they recognize that they can't just throw Probably 10 or 12 years ago, there was a big bill that did something similar to Senate Bill 444. It did, like, it's supposed to provide a bunch of money for uh, water infrastructure, water projects around the state. 
Well, it got funded for two years, and then the economy started to, to dip, and they quit funding. So they went from about $400 million investment in water projects down to zero within, a, I guess, a three or four year period. Well, we don't want that to happen again. That, that's just not the right answer. It needs to be a sustained uh, effort at trying to uh, clean up Florida's waterways and uh, create more supply for uh, water supply. One of the issues you heard me talk about, no more at the front end, water, water quality. There's a couple of things that are, that are affecting the water quality in the state. And the legislature over the last few years has tried to preempt the local government authority related to uh, urban fertilizer use. We're not talking about agricultural farm use kind of stuff. We're talking about stuff that you put on your lawn. And a lot of cities have adopted these ordinances dealing with, um, that basically say you can't apply the fertilizer before a rain event. And the fertilizer industry has said, oh no, you can't, can't do that to us because it rains all the time in Florida. Well, yeah, it does on, in a lot of times during the year. Um, and during those times, they should not be applying fertilizer when it's, when it's raining out. We actually have pictures of people out in the rain, you know, the Scots, I don't want to use any company, sorry. That was my name, not a company. I just slipped with my name. Uh, certain companies that we have photos of them out, you know, like uh, applying fertilizer in the rain. They get paid per amount to do it, per job, et cetera. And that's it's okay. That's the profit motive of our capitalistic system. That's awesome. But there needs to be some common sense to it that if it's just going to rinse off into the ocean, into the waterways, whether it's the ocean or whether it's a lake or whatever it is, uh, it just doesn't work. And so local governments, we've been fighting that fight with the fertilizer, the, the urban fertilizer industry for, for several years. We've been successful in fending them off there are efforts uh, in terms of preempting our authority, local government authority. I think this year we're not going to see any legislation relating to that because I think that uh, the Senate last year uh, uh, roundly uh, voted that down and the votes, the same people are in the Senate this year that were in there last year. So I think that the fertilizer industry at this year may take, may take this year off, plus with the focus on water quality and water quantity that they understand it may not be politically appropriate or viable for them this year. So that's good. That's a home rule issue, but it's also one that protects the waterways of the state of Florida. Without the water, people don't want to visit here. We don't have, you know, there's a whole, you all know, you surf in lousy water, you, you know, just a whole bunch of stuff. And so, uh, so that's one of the, that's one of the key issues. Related to that is a couple of years ago, uh, there was legislation that, I'll try to give you a really short description of it, um, septic tank inspection programs. The legislature created this septic tank inspection program. They basically put what you could do on a very small sheet of paper as a local government. They said, all right, you can only have an inspection program that is within this limited box here. Well, the limited box pretty much allowed us to do nothing. It, it was very, very, very limiting to local governments. Well, again, as part of the water quality issue, there seems to be some recognition that septic tank fields are a big problem in terms of contributing to the water quality problems in the state of Florida. And uh, so looking at that, there was a, a there's been a draft bill floating around. It's there's and here I'm gonna I'm gonna be really frank with you all in terms of you know cities have we're contributors through reclaimed water. We do the right thing by trying to do reclaimed water by you know, creating a reclaimed water system and then it's high in nitrogen. So the nitrogen runs off and runs in waterways and it's the same as a septic field. So, you know, we're we're trying to do that balance too, trying to figure out what's the right what's the right policy approach, where you know, what's the right answer to this. Um, septic tank issue is one that uh, there was a draft of some legislation floating around that said that uh, Anyone in the septic tank field that was near a uh, impaired waterway had to connect to a centralized water system. Well, that sounds really good, right? It sounds like that's the answer. Except for if the cost of connecting. I know I'm on septic in Tallahassee, and the nearest central sewer line for me is about a mile away. Well, that's an awful lot of money for connecting to that. So the policy, you say, well, that's, that's what we should do. It's, it's simple, but it's not simple because it requires a lot of money to do 
what the right thing is to do. And so going back to that whole water quality and water, water supply issue in terms of the funding available, that's one of the things that we want to see the funding be available for is to help defray the cost, whether it's a floating grant, meaning a rotating type of grant as it's paid back, other people can borrow that money again, et cetera. Whatever it is, we're trying to work with the legislature to come up with good answers on how we can achieve the goal of better water quality in the state of Florida, better water, more water supply that's not going to just keep sticking a pipe in the ground and pulling the water out. There's other ways to do it. Reservoirs for water, we get a lot of rain in Florida. We don't do a very good job. Other states do a much better job of containing that water. Right now, we have a lot of um, stormwater ponds, and we use, basically, we collect water for that, but we don't collect it for drinking. And there's other states that do collect their water for drinking. We don't really do that very much right now in the state of Florida. A couple of areas do. So those are the kind of things that they're looking at in the legislative process. And we, we think that's a, a good start for them in terms of you know, the direction that they wanted. But I, I, I caution you that none of these answers are easy. They really are. For everything you do, uh, you know, you say you're going to start collecting more water. Well, then that takes water off the tax rolls, essentially, if you're going to essentially give it a, sort of a farming exemption. Uh, you know, like, like the, the, the green belt law or something like that. So there's there's impacts. There's uh, there's lots of everything. Nothing happens in a vacuum, and that's part of my message to you tonight. Is when when you think you hear an easy solution to something, there's not really anything that's ever simple. There's always lots of uh, ripple effects to whatever whatever it is, whatever policy. And the legislators in Tallahassee. I would say 99.9%, I won't tell you the one who I think isn't there for the right reason, but um, um, most of them are there to do a good job. They're trying to serve their constituents and trying to help make the state of Florida a better place for the citizens, for the businesses, or just, you know, for, for everyone in general. And I use that percentage. I have a brother who's a legislator. I haven't told him whether he's the one I think that is or isn't yet, so, you know, so it's a pretty open question at this point. Um, so that's water quality, water quantity. Uh, those are those are two of the things. Um, one of the really big issues for the League of Cities and for cities, and really honestly, um, for the citizens in general, uh, pensions. The, specifically, in with respect to cities, and these are these are my clients are are the uh, police and firefighter pensions. Um, let me. Start off by saying I'm not anti-union. I don't have I don't have a fight with the unions at all. I think that they serve a legitimate public purpose. I think that they're you know they're they're to sit across from the table from a, from a police and firefighter union, uh, collective bargaining union. The League of Cities, we're okay. We think that cities ought to be able to do that. Having said that, we think that we ought to be able to do that without the thumb of the scale being on this uh, the thumb of the state being on the scale in favor of the police and firefighter unions. And we believe, with all due respect, so uh, that that is the situation now, is that in 1999, the legislature passed a law that said, and I think this gets really complicated really fast, so I'm gonna try to just keep it 50,000 foot view, and if I, if I misspeak, I'm not trying to mislead, I'm just trying to really give a 50,000 foot view and it's hard to do that and not leave something out that says, oh, we left that out, that really matters. Yes, that's true, so I'm going to tell you now, and he leaves some stuff out because I'm trying to cut to the 50,000 foot view of it. The legislature in 1999, uh, the first piece of legislation that Governor Bush signed when he was governor was it required cities to provide extra benefits to police and firefighters. It's a level of benefits that, that's above what other what other um, uh, retirees and, and uh, pensioners are receiving. Well, since 1999, that extra benefit provision has cost cities about $520 million. That's over half a billion dollars in extra benefits that are going to police and firefighters. I don't have a problem with the police and firefighters. My issue is having the state tell local governments how they have to spend their money and what benefits they have to provide to the police and firefighters. We think that it ought to be that the, uh, the market ought to solve that problem. If the citizens, if they, if, 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 first of all, if the city cuts a bad deal with their police and firefighters, then you as the voters get to go to the, the city council at the, the next election and say, 
you guys did a terrible job. That was a terrible deal. You gave too much or you didn't give enough. We can't get any police and firefighters to come work in this city. So you're doing something wrong. So we think that the market will take care of it itself. We don't think the legislature ought to be dictating to local governments what the level of pension benefits should be. We, the $520 million, in our opinion, is $520 million. We had this big, a couple of years ago, that was when Charlie Chris was governor, you know, let's make property taxes drop like a rock. Well, we think that if we didn't have to be spending money on police and fire pensions like we're doing now, that maybe we could be doing more for economic development, maybe we could even be doing more for water quality, for some of those leaking pipes I talked about, for spending that money in a lot of other areas that we're not spending it in now because we're having to focus it on the police and firefighter pensions. Um, so we think that there needs to be changes to the police and firefighter pensions. All we want is to be able to sit across from the table with the police and firefighter unions and have a fair bargaining negotiation. We cut a bad, the city's cut a bad deal under those conditions. That's up to the voters to tell them, tell their, their council members that that's what they've done. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty big one. The changes in the MRS system that are being discussed uh, are something that we're sort of monitoring to the extent that there's a, a fair number of cities that have uh, opted to go, it, it, it's about 10% of the cities actually have, have opted to go into the FRS system, that's the state retirement system. And so we monitor that to make sure that any deal that's cut in terms of through the legislative process with the uh, FRS system doesn't also make cities have to open up their walls and contribute a whole bunch more money. Uh, we think that there's some fair ideas out there, so there's some good ideas. Uh, there seems to be much discussion about whether an 80% funded plan is the right level of funding or whether it's 90% or 100% or whatever. I'm going to let the actuaries fight about that. Um, they know a lot more about that than I do. Uh, as I said, I have one more the skill. That's the legislative process. So I'm going to let the actuaries fight about that, uh, whether the numbers are right. But with the FRS system, the state's trying to figure out a way where it can become more solid and sort of get away from um, defined benefit approach, which is, seems to be costing an, an awful lot of money to define benefit approach. Most businesses around the country have gone to defined contribution uh, and enhanced the, or increased the amount that the uh, worker has to contribute to the pension plan. That hasn't been necessarily the case around the state, and so we are optimistic that there seems to be enough um, uh, momentum behind that issue that hopefully we'll get something done. Having said that, it's an election, and there's not typically during an election year uh, the desire to do really big, bold policy initiatives because uh, it's an election. People want to kind of coast and sort of just take care of the, you know, tend the home fires a little bit more instead of trying to uh, big, bold policy. It's just sort of the way it's a governor. When I say an election, I mean the governor's up. You know, the, 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 there's big races up. If it was, I mean, every two years an election or so, so we'd never get anything done if that was true across the board. But I mean, the, the big, big offices, there tends to be more of a, a holding pattern. I mean, yeah, that's pretty much the case, too. Yeah. I'm looking to make, you, make sure you're not like, well, what's he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just listening. Yeah. Uh, so, along the lines of, of um, we, there's a common thread through all this money, <laughs> and uh, you, you may may catch that yourself, but I'll just point it out to you. So one of the money issues is right now in the state law, there's something called the communication services tax. It's basically the tax you pay on your cell phone, on your landline. If anybody think we still have a landline, um, okay, all right, cool. One or two still have yeah. um, your landline, some of your other uh, cable services, etc. Well, the technology is changing in terms of the, the industry, the, the uh, cable guys are delivering services differently. There's more stuff that's being able to, who watches TV um, really in the old fashioned TV anymore? Not very many people, I, I use Netflix to watch shows and get caught up, you know. And uh, so even the, deli so the delivery of some really basic kind of stuff is, is not being delivered the way it used to. A lot, a lot more stuff's going over the internet and 
the federal government has said you can't tax stuff that's over the internet, and so um, this communication services tax, which is a big chunk of money for both the state and local governments, it's a declining revenue source, and it's rapidly declining. And so we're trying to figure out, we being the league, we being the legislature, we being local governments, are all trying to figure out how are we going to replace this? We bonded it. A lot of local governments have bonded it. The states bonded it. So this declining revenue source is not even soon enough. It's not even going to be paying for a lot of what just to pay off the bonds, um, which is not a good position for anybody in the end. Um, so trying to figure out a way to, to address that. Um, there's talk of cutting the rate. 2% is basically taking it down from, I guess it's 6.8% right now down to 4.8% uh, and seeing sort of what happens there as a result of that. Um, that wouldn't touch the local government um, piece of it. Um, so we, we'd be all right with that. Um, it does ultimately affect local governments because part of what's collected gets redistributed back out to local governments through um, municipal revenue sharing and, and other ways of, of distribution of formulas. And so it would have an impact, but less less adverse than just sort of just coming in and saying, all right, we're going to repeal the communication services tax, which was being discussed at one point. And then the state said, oh gosh, that's like a two and a half billion dollar hit to us. We can't do that yet. So trying to figure out a way to wean everybody off of that. I think we're going to see some legislation moving in that direction this year. Like I said, it would probably be a 2% cut in that rate. Um, which is consistent with Governor Scott's approach. He wants to cut $500 million in taxes this year. And he has said openly that he wants uh, those that $500 million to affect more of the average citizen rather than just the, the, business, the businesses that have been the beneficiaries of lower corporate income tax, the lower corporate taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So Governor Scott has said, we want these tough cuts to affect the average person's pocket. We think that's a pretty good approach, but we think it needs to be very measured, very careful. The state agrees with that because they have definitely money in this in this pot too. So uh, that's one of the issues. The other related thing is their uh, issue is that there's something called a local business tax, and it's essentially a tax that is imposed on businesses within the boundaries of both the city and the county, uh, or the uh, or doing business within that city or county. And people say, well, why do we have to pay a tax for that? Well, it's typically the average the average tax is about $125 around the state. So it's not like it's a huge hit to businesses. They're not going to go out and hire a new employee with that $125 a year. It's just unless it's a really cheap employee. But um, but the typically the money is used for to make sure that, for instance, uh, you don't want to see a welding shop open up right next door to a paper supplier, for instance, because and if you if you have such a a situation you want to make sure that you allocate resources like maybe an extra fire truck in that area because there's some potential for some problems to happen with a welding shop right next door to a paper store so um, typically local governments are using the local business tax revenues to do things like that is to basically allocate resources to process the paperwork of just sort of the zoning and zoning compliance and a whole bunch of other things there's talk about trying to repeal that local business tax Again, that's a bonded source of money. We uh, can't really afford to, to let that go. The legislature has, uh, over the last 10, 12 years, has rolled back our property taxes, has rolled back other taxing, uh, other ways for us to raise revenue, so that local business tax is one that um, uh, is a pretty important revenue stream. Uh, it raises about $310 million, I guess, a year um, for for local governments, that's across the state, so that's 67 counties and 410 uh, cities. So it's, for each city, it's not necessarily, but in some cities, it's more than others, depending on the population, whether they're more uh, residential oriented or more business oriented, and those kind of factors all come into play. So that's something else that we think that the uh, that has been talked about in terms of one of the ways to uh, get to that $500 million uh, figure. Uh, Talk about pension reform. Economic development. Um, the state has done a really good job over the last, I would say, really 10 years or so of really trying to be uh, 
uh, more business friendly. Uh, it's always certainly on the front burner for, for uh, policymakers in general. We recognize that Florida is growing, you have people, you have jobs, people are going to come to the state of Florida. Uh, there's a balance of obviously of you know, environmental people are coming to Florida we can for our resources and things like that. Um, so economic development. We think that one of the things last year the legislature rightfully put in place some accountability for some of the uh, and transparency for some of the economic development incentives. <laughs> they were handed out uh, in the economic development incentives kind of like candy. Uh, and not following through on if a business said that they were going to create 200 jobs, they never did any follow-up to see if actually 200 jobs were created. And so last year they put into place some legislation that is going to increase that accountability and that transparency. We think that's good. Um, we think from the League of City standpoint, first of all, when businesses move to the state of Florida, they don't just sort of hover above the state. They land within a city. They have an impact on a city or a county in terms of the roads, the, the other businesses. Um, and so we think cities have been great partners in the economic development front. If you look at any city, they're all typically, they're all members of their chambers of commerce. They're trying to work with the local business community, trying to draw businesses into the community. There's not any city that I know of, and I've certainly looked around for some, uh, that are saying, no, nope, we don't want any more businesses in our, in our city. We want businesses in our city. It helps our citizens live more full lives, have a full range of businesses and uh, services and things available to them. But the thing that we think has been missing is that there's been an awful lot of focus on getting big businesses to come to the state of Florida and not enough focus on the smaller businesses. About 82%, I think is the right number, um, of the businesses have uh, 12 or fewer employees. And we just don't think that enough has been done, uh, not necessarily by cities, but really just, just in general from, from just a policy standpoint. We all want to get the big headline of, oh, 500 jobs coming to this city or this county or to the state or whatever. There needs to be more focus on economic development for small businesses. That's something that the league and Representative Atkins actually has, has come address our group several times on that issue. Uh, sort of regionalized approach and sort of what we can do best, best management practices for trying to bring businesses in and just really trying to help plant, first plow the ground and plant good seeds so that we get uh, some, some good business growth here in the state, in the state of Florida. Uh, for small businesses as well as big businesses. And I think we're going to see some legislation dealing with that, but it's definitely a priority of the League of Cities to help encourage the state to provide more incentives to small businesses to operate here, to open up here, to just remain here in the state of Florida. Um, housing uh, and small city CDBG. This is really, really inside baseball stuff. Community development block grants are the money that comes from the federal government to the state of Florida uh, and then are distributed to local governments for a variety of projects. It can be for weatherization, it can be for affordable housing, it can be for a host of whatever they have, just a whole bunch of different type of projects. Last year there was an effort by the DEO, Department of uh, Economic Opportunities in, uh, up in Tallahassee. They basically wanted to change the rules in terms of the the rules for local governments applying for the money for the CDBG money from the from or from the state, and we think the rules would have allowed the state to have too much say in terms of no, that's not the right kind of economic uh, economic development project, so we're not going to fund that. We think that economic development is sort of in the eyes of the beholder. If 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 you as a city or a citizen you want to see. Uh, you know, more viro tourism, that that's, your, that's what you want to focus on. And that's what your the citizens in that area have agreed that they want to do. We think that should be every bit as eligible for CDBG type, type funding as should the traditional, you know, business venture. So the DEO proposed these rules that we're going to change, the proposed legislation that we're going to change the rules. We fought that, they withdrew that. Uh, we were able to success, we were successful in, in fighting that back. We think this year we've been partnering with DEO all along, and we think that they're going to come out with some rules that are, or some legislation that is, in fact, going to deal with the CDBG money that's going to be 
helpful for local governments. It'll get where they want to go in terms of more accountability, more, more transparency, more sense of what they're actually giving the money for. We think that's good. There's no problem with accountability and transparency. We're all for it. So the, that's, this one's really an inside kind of a baseball uh, issue, uh, but it's, it's an important one to, to cities across the state. Uh, the other issue deals with uh, the housing piece. Uh, there was a uh, settlement with the, a, a lot of the national banks uh, for, uh, you, you read about the mortgage fraud cases, and they were robo-signing and doing a bunch of stuff. And the state of Florida got a huge chunk of money for that. And it was supposed to go towards um, helping people that were upside down and water in their houses and stuff like that. And we believe that not enough of that money went towards that. The legislature ended up, which made some sense. In the state of Florida had the longest, once you were in foreclosure, it was 800 and something days from the time it went into foreclosure to the end process. That's three plus years. Um, we were backlog. We had a huge court backlog. So the legislature applied some of that money. They paid for new judges to help expedite that foreclosure process to move some of that so along. Well, now that we've done that, we think that that money ought to go to the intended purpose. And it ought to not be, they ought to not create a bunch of new programs or agencies or entities in Tallahassee that are going to distribute the money. Local governments, we have housing foundations within local governments. We have, there's, the infrastructure is in place for that money to be distributed. And we ought to utilize what's in place and the legislature ought to, with very limited number of strings, except for that it be used for what it was intended to be used for, we think there ought to not be very many strings and there ought to be uh, available in local governments. Um, Cameras and red lights, not every city is in love with this issue, uh, but we, just as a matter of, you've heard me talk at the front end about home rule. Uh, we think that if a city wants to have red light cameras, that they ought to be able to do that. And there's an effort in Tallahassee to repeal the local government, <coughs> local government's authority to have cameras at red lights for, to, for traffic infractions, um, particularly running red lights, um, and we want to see that technology be able to be used. We think that having a camera cite somebody and instead of having a police officer or sheriff sitting at the intersection when they, should, when they could be out patrolling, maybe deterring more, more uh, intensive crime, more uh, victim-oriented crime, we think that's a better use of resources and thus we think that cameras are a, a, a reasonable option, an alternative. They have restricted the limitations in terms of Right on red when you can and can't write a ticket. I mean, they basically put a, put it again in a pretty small box. We're okay with that in terms of the box that they put in. It's pretty pretty limited option uh, 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 application in terms of when you can, how you can, etc. Write tickets for for cameras that are using the camera at red light. That's a home rule issue for us. That's just something that we think the legislature ought to not be sticking its business in a local government's uh, business on that. Transportation funding along sort of the same lines is right now counties have an awful lot of um, local options available to them. The county can put on the ballot for local option gas tax and for a bunch of other um, transportation infrastructure. Cities, we don't have any of those options available to us. We think that if a group of cities uh, within a county wants to force the county to take a vote on a local option because the county won't do it and their cities want to, that we ought to be able to impose that tax at the low, at the, within the municipal boundaries. Uh, and if the county in the unincorporated area doesn't want to impose the tax, fine. People will drive outside the county limits, outside the city limits to buy their gas if they are that upset, worked up about the price. And I mean, the market works. You know, people, if they don't like the price, so I've driven across town to go buy a different pair of, a pair of shoes at a different price. So, it works, you know, I probably use as much gas as it did to save all the shoes, but anyway. Um, but, uh, so we think that local governments ought to have, cities in particular ought to have more authority to um, raise revenue. Right now, we have, we're limited to what basically essentially the state gives us based on the revenue sharing uh, formula. And the revenue sharing formula, uh, is largely geared, it, it favors counties because back when the formula was created, um, counties had more say in things than, than cities did, and we think that the formula ought to be changed the way that the gas.
gas tax uh, funds are distributed from the state, that they ought to be more equally distributed between population on a matter, not just number of lane miles that you have, because you can have an awful lot of lane miles without very many people traveling those roads. Uh, and so we think that there should be some sort of formula that more equitably distributes uh, those gas tax dollars. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, not really a big issue here yet, <laughs> but it will be. Um, because usually when one area of the state sees a problem, it's just a matter of time before it starts to come up the coast. And the next thing you know, we're going, oh my gosh, we have a problem. Sober homes. Um, so what are sober homes? Kind of what you think they are. It's where people come and live and they are supposed to be sober. But they are operating really without any regulations um, in, in some instances. If you don't have a licensed provider on, on premises, then you don't fall under the DCF, Department of uh, Children and Family Services uh, regulatory scheme. And so there's some pretty, again, the market, it's amazing to me, just, just the market works. Sometimes it creates weird, perverse incentives. This is one. So people have these big houses and the market turned down, they built these you know, homes, and they said, well, what am I going to do? And so they advertise on the internet saying, well, come live in a sober environment. So you get eight or ten people that have addiction problems living in a house with absolutely nobody there overseeing them at all. So it's a bunch of you know, addicts, and praise God that they're there trying to get help. But with no oversight, nobody there to like, regulate things, and the state not looking into it to making sure that they don't even, under current law, they don't even have to tell cities or counties that they're setting up in that way. That they're literally just, they, they set up sort of as an apartment house, and then they uh, advertise on the internet, sober house, with very little regulation. Not a problem, it's Miami, South Florida, Orlando, St. Pete, big problem. It's already started in South Florida, of course, like a lot of things. And it's just sort of working its way up the state, and it will be a problem here if we don't get control of that. And, uh, so we're asking the state to uh, set some regulations, minimum standards, and if local governments want to have more stringent standards on those, then we ought to be able to do that. But the state ought to at least set some minimum boundaries, because cities are trying to do it now, and there's been court cases, and they said, ah, you can't really regulate it that way. So we need the legislature to step in on this one and say, here's some minimum standards. You guys have to follow this. It's, it's getting to be a really big problem. Similarly, the other issue, deals with vacation rentals. A couple of years ago, uh, the legislature preempted local government authority to regulate vacation homes. Why do you say, you, why, why do vacation homes need regulated? Well, you build this really mammoth house that has uh, you know, eight or 12 rooms and holds 18 people, and it's great. Unless you live right next door to one of those, and suddenly you have 18 houses in your driveway, and you've got people actually living there, and it's, it, it, the, these vacation homes, these big homes are being essentially hotels without having to pay the bed tax, without having to be inspected by the state or the local government for the things that hotels have to be to make sure that the sheets are clean, to make sure that there's no rats, to make sure that there's, you know, little things like that, health, safety, welfare kind of issues. And so a couple of years ago, the legislature came in and said, ah, eh, local governments, there's too many different regulations around the state. We need to, we need to, uh, preempt your authority on that. Well, they've actually, and Senator Thrasher, to his credit, has spoken up and said, we need to do something about this. This is a big problem. We preempted local governments, and now these vacation homes are popping up all over the place, and people are using them essentially as hotels. And we flop want houses. Flop, flop. Right. Exactly. I mean, they, huh. it's, it, it, it's pretty, there's some pretty dicey stuff going on out there with those. But the legislature preempted our authority, and it's up to the state, and they don't have the resources to do any sort of check on uh, uh, any type of um, checks on what's going on there, no regulatory enforcement, no anything. So it's a problem. We want to see the legislature remove that preemption. Senator Thrasher has indicated he's going to file, file a bill dealing with that issue to undo the preemption. He said, oops, we, we might have made a mistake on this one legislature. Let's back up and let's redo this. We think that would be good public policy. Um, Those are, those are pretty much some of the, the big key issues. Let me tell you a couple other things that have popped up already. 
uh, in terms of in Tallahassee that, that are not lead items, but that we but that we see are already happening. Um, I talked about five hundred million dollars in taxes in, that the governor wants to cut. We don't know where all that's going to come from. The governor has also asked the agencies to cut a hundred million dollars from their budgets. Um, that affects programs. We're not saying that it's bad things, but until we see what programs are going to be cut with that hundred million dollar in hundred million dollars in cuts. We should be paying attention to that to make sure that, that it's not programs, uh, you know, for instance, maybe the affordable housing program or uh, water quality inspections or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, there's real programs that if you cut a hundred million, there are real programs and real people that are going to be affected. We need to sort of see where that all falls out. Um, as I said, it's an election year. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of nibbling around the edges on some policy stuff. Uh, I think the legislature has tackled some, some pretty heavy issues, not necessarily successfully, but, but they certainly tried to tried to address some pretty big issues. Um, but because of the election year, and you hear a lot of times, yeah, it's election year, let's just slow down on that. Um, so that's going to sort of, I think that you'll see pretty minimal number of, of pieces of legislation actually um, filed. And again, I want to thank all of you. The fact that you're here tonight, I know you have better things to do with your time, but it, it really, input from the citizens, it matters. I, I literally, I, I said it before, it's exciting to me to see people in, in come hear some talk about legislative issues because it shows that you care and it, it shows that you want to try to feed part of the change, you know. I, I really believe that if, you know, I, my, one of my sons has a vote, I'm like, shut up, you don't vote, you don't have a vote, you know, you just don't have a say in it. So he's, no, it doesn't work anyway. Well, it doesn't work because you don't, you're not helping it by not voting. So, um, so I think that being involved is really important, and I applaud you all for being here and for being involved. It's obvious that you are, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you have. And I know I covered a whole lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. probably went over my time, too, so. Um. Home rule seems to work best. By the time our tax money gets to Tallahassee and flows back to us through the county, to the city, it winds up with stipulations on it that may fit perfectly for Miami or Daytona Beach or Orlando, but don't work at all for Neptune Beach or Jacksonville Beach. Well said, sir. I'm going to make a commercial out of you. <laughs> we agree. How do we keep that money here? Well, you talk to your legislator and you tell them, Home rule, leave us alone. Don't we don't need stuff to go to Tallahassee? Like I talked about with the housing money, it shouldn't have to go to the state collected the the the, um, the settlement, so you know it went into the state coffers. But there's no reason for the state to have to set up programs when there's already programs in place at the lo at the local level. Water quality. It's funny when the U.S. EPA tried to impose two years ago when the U.S. EPA tried to impose standards, water quality standards on the state of Florida. The legislature went crazy, saying, "This is this is un this is an unprecedented imposition of our state's rights, and you know, just going on about our state knows best about what's best for our state." And legislators that I never get to vote by the way on home rule issues, I when they I went through and said, "I heard you on the floor the other day talking about how important it is that people in this in the area know best." We agree with you. That's what it's all about. And so engaging your legislators, telling them, hey, let us make the decisions local. Are there some decisions? There's an awful lot of decisions that need to be made at the state level. There are, but there's also an awful lot of decisions that need to be made at the local level. And some of them need to learn the difference. Mr. Dudley, thank you for taking the trouble to come here from Tallahassee. No trouble. On my uh, trips to Tallahassee, I've had about three hours. Uh, it's a good time. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to, to say as a volunteer with the Sierra Club that we appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with the Florida League Cities on the uh, nutrient issues and, and preemption uh, on fertilizer ordinances. And I uh, just wanted to appreciate the work that you do with the Sierra Club folks in Tallahassee on, on that matter. It's, you know, water quality is very important. You probably follow a bit of the reports of green slime on the St. John's River and it's perked up in the last uh, month or so as an issue again locally and it relates to this very complex but important 
problem about Thank you. How we deal with nutrients in the environment. Thanks for saying that. We don't, we've, had some, we've been on the other side of the fence uh, from Sierra Club on other issues where it's great when we're working together on stuff because you guys are, you know, uh, together we're pretty formidable. Uh, we, the fertilizer legislation is a perfect example. Sierra Club's involvement in that basically kept that from happening along with the local governments. We, it was a big push and it was a good coalition and we appreciate that. Uh, in How you the pension, I'm sorry. How you doing? Getting back to the pension issue, uh, you stated that in 1999 the, the state required minimum benefits to the uh, pension plans. Extra benefits. Right, extra yes. benefits. There were well, already minimum. There were certain minimum benefits already in place. But weren't those uh, funded by the Chapter 175 and 185 funds? Well, no, not not full. That's the problem. Is that they they're not fully funded. And that's exactly what the problem is. And so we have unfunded liability that continues to grow. If they were fully funded, then I think the state would be appropriate in saying, well, we're going to force you to provide this benefit, but we're also going to give you all the money for that benefit. But that's not what's happening now. They've forced us to give the benefit, but they haven't fully funded it. And that's the problem. Well, I was a, I was a trustee on the pension board in Jacksonville Beach. And when those minimum benefits uh, went into effect, Chapter 185 and 175 money, was to fund those benefits, and they didn't go into effect until the funds actually accumulated to cover them. So I don't see how that actually affects the the taxpayers as far as property taxes. Well, it, 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 um, we can we can argue about whether it does or doesn't, but I'm telling you that the from from the city's perspective, and from we have legislators that agree because they filed bills to fix it, that they believe that in fact it allows for the accrual of a, of a pretty substantial unfunded liability and for, from those extra benefits and at what point do you stop giving extra benefits and the way we view it is that you're asking people this is a really you may not agree with this analogy but that's okay um, we're having a hard time making our mortgage payment and those extra benefits we view as like a pool and a second story and upgrade to windows and stuff like that and we can't afford the mortgage and the state's telling us that we have to add a pool and tinted windows and all that stuff and we can't afford the mortgage and so it just doesn't make sense that we're having to provide these extra benefits when we can't even afford the base level of benefits now we could walk away from the chapter 175 185 money but we're, we still have huge unfunded liability we have cities in this in the state City of St. Pete, 85% of their payroll costs are pension benefits for police and firefighters. That's just a ludicrous amount of money. And right. we could talk all day about yeah. that. That has to do with assumptions and everything else that it, it does. Yeah. And that's part of the problem too, is that the pension boards are independent largely from from the, they hand the, the city a piece of paper at the end and say, oh, our assumptions didn't work out, this is what you owe. And that's not really the best approach either. We think that they the pension boards ought to be made up. If, you're, if we're contributing 80%, then we ought to have 80% of the representation on those boards. So. Yes. Let's kind of get back to the revenue cuts issue, like the tax cuts, and that no business or firm would arbitrarily decide that they're going to cut their revenues over the course of the year and then figure out what services they're going to cut, you know, to make up for. Instead, you might go and look and see what you're doing, see whether it's fat and waste, you know, see what you can cut and see what you end up with. But in, instead, we citizens kind of like the idea of tax cuts because we're told that there's a lot of waste and abuse in government. But then when the cuts come, fire teachers, fire firefighters, fire police officers, here in Jacksonville, we don't uh, pass our roads and we're not mowing the grass on the median strips. Yeah. Meanwhile, we've got green slime on the river, the highest murder rate in the country or the state. Uh, tuberculosis outbreaks, you know, and, and a lot of stuff like that. And so. You know, with the discussion of pensions as well, really the last thing that local governments need to do is to be uh, saddled with a lot of other expenses that uh, the state was contributing something to. We agree. We agree. And, it, and it, it goes perfectly with the comments that I made in terms of the, the ripple effect of policy right. decisions is that nothing happens in a vacuum. And when, when something happens, you know, when they cut here, it's a balloon, you squeeze here, and the air has to go somewhere. And that's pretty much what we're looking at. Um, I, in 2011, um, one of the state legislators submitted um, uh, a bill that had been written by Alec, and it included Alec's mission statement and name in it. Uh -huh. 
Um, uh, and before it was caught, and she withdrew it and took that paragraph out and put it back in. Uh -huh. How much of the legislation that is submitted in, in Florida just got is, is written by legislators or their aides, and how much is written by some other organization that they then just process? Well, I, I can't give you the percentage, but, but mm -hmm. you have to be careful. You're a special interest. Okay. Sierra Club's a special interest. Cities are a special interest. I mean, we all, I, I, I mountain bike guy, and I want funding to go towards more trails and paths. I'm a special interest. So we're all special interests, okay? So we have to sort of hug that and embrace it and say, okay, that's, that's cool. So now, what level of influence do special interests have? Well, we actually want, because we're all special interests, we want special interests to have a fair amount of influence. Now, having said that, there is a limit in terms of some of those outside group, and it's not just Alec. There's NCSL, which is a sister organization that's on the liberal side, and it happened on the liberal side just as much as it did on the conservative, where that Alec tends to be a more conservative organization. NCSL is a more liberal organization. They did the same thing. There's, there's template or cookie cutter type legislation that states, you know, you go to these conferences and you say, hey, League of Cities, we have conferences, and we tell cities, hey, this city's doing this, and they go back home, and they say, oh, wow, this city's doing that, let's do this. So there's not really, per se, anything uh, uh, wrong with that, unless it's not good policy for the state of Florida, and that's ultimately what we have to look at, is what, whether the policy is good policy or bad policy. We had legislation last year dealing with public-private partnerships. It was an out of piece of legislation. Cities love public-private partnerships. We, we've had... Um, public private partnerships for years. But this legislation said that now we have to do public private partnerships this way. Again, they drew that box, and it's a pretty limiting box. And so cities are now saying, we're not sure we want to do public private partnerships that look like that. So I, I, I caution, I mean, that does happen, but it's not necessarily a bad thing because there's some, been some awful good ideas that have come from some of those groups when you go share ideas and you say, wow, we're doing this in the state. In fact, the state of Texas just did a, a big bond initiative for their water infrastructure. Well, the state of Florida is looking at that and saying, yeah, that's a pretty cool idea. Maybe that's how we'll do it too, revolving loans. And so I, 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 your point's take, well taken, but, but, but it, we have to be careful about how we sort of frame that and, uh, and understand that A, we're all special interests in one form or another. And that there's not necessarily a bad thing about sharing ideas. What we have to ultimately boil it down to is it, a, it is it an idea that's good for Florida, or is it just an idea that's just sort of let's do it because other states are doing it? Or is it a good idea to help get me elected? Yeah. Certainly, some of that. There's, I told you that 99.9 .9 is good. There's that 0.01 percent. I'm not telling you who it is. 0.01 percent. <laughs> Chicken in every pot, let's say, just to be. But they don't give you the money to buy the chickens or the pots. So then they tell you you gotta go do put a put chicken in every pot and you gotta provide the pots and the chickens, and they don't give you the money to do that. That's what an unfunded mandate is. And the federal government passes them on to the state sometimes and to local governments, and sometimes it's the state telling local governments you have to do ABC and they don't give us the money to do it. How did we get that? Uh, it's it's okay. legislating 101. It's been going on for millennia. <laughs> but sometimes wouldn't those be things like when the federal government said all city vehicles or all vehicles have to have seat belts? Yes. Right? And so then you had well, where cities might say, oh gosh, for us to go back and put seat belts in our cars, that would be an unfunded mandate. But there was a decision made that seatbelts save lives, and therefore it's important that you have seatbelts. You're in exactly right. And so the public policy 
there's a difference, and, and, and your point's re it's a really good point. We can talk a long time about this. The policy doesn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a, a chicken in every pot doesn't even seem like a bad policy necessarily. I'm, I'm just, just to be really broad and say, you know, people get to eat, and there's maybe an influx of pot manufacturers, and blah, 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 you know, you can, all the good stuff about it. But, so it's not an argument against the policy, it's the, 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 the decision to impose that policy without providing the adequate funding to actually realistically implement that policy is what the issue is. So it's, it's not an argument necessarily, sometimes we argue with the policy too, we say it's bad policy and it's an unfunded mandate, and pull out. so. An argument for unfunded mandates is that if you give the local governments money to do something, they have no incentive to innovate and try to do it less expensively, whereas if they're, this is the devolution argument you know, all over again, if, you, if the local communities have to do it themselves, they may well innovate and find a cheaper way to do it, and then that can spread around other places. Not saying that works all the time, but yeah, there's an argument for it. Yeah, I, we, we can have, I, I love to hear some examples of where that's actually, yeah, I mean, where that's been, in real world, where that's actually been, where the local government said, oh, well, that's cool, well, now, we, now we can do this. And it's not cool. just the they local say, They say it sucks, we have to figure out how to do this, but sometimes, you know, communities do figure out the cheaper sure. way to do it. Yeah. Well, that's the beauty of the other issue that we were talking about, is home rule, is that local government, not only does the market work, but politics works in a, in a lot in so many ways. Because the the policy maker, and I mean politics in the in the policy sense of it, in that there's policy, and you have to say, all right, we have to make this work. And how are we going to do this? One, two, three, lift, and everybody does it, or it doesn't work. And that's really the beauty of it in a lot of ways. Except that the lifting isn't equal. Uh, the beach and cities just got finished spending a lot of money on uh, pollution treatment to reduce the total dissolved solids and the nitrogen going into the river. Jacksonville Beach spent $20 million for a small city with 20 or 30,000 people. At the same time, the paper mill upstream from us cried that they couldn't afford to drink their wastewater, so the state allows them to dump it into the river raw. That makes, the lifting is not equal. Um, I would argue that there are dumping in law. Uh, there's federal laws against that. There are state laws against that. I mean, they're not. They may not be treating it to the degree that you want to treat it. But I would argue that there's not very often that things are going in completely uh, as point source pollution that are being completely untreated. I, I don't want that. I, mean, I don't. I'm not trying to debate you on that. I, I just. But I, I think we have to be careful about the words that we use. The words matter. And when you say untreated, raw. That, that's just, I mean, we have, there's laws against that. There's federal laws against it, there's state laws against it. Whether it's treated to the level that you think is satisfactory, we can have that discussion and we can, we can there's scientists on both sides that can say, yeah, it is, or no, it isn't. You know, you can have a science argument. But to say raw, I think, is probably um, a bit <coughs> hy hyperbolic, maybe, if, with all due respect. It certainly is equivalent to the kind of water quality we have to put out in our effluent. That's exactly right. All right, it's not only a league, uh, a municipal question, and it can be a yes or no, but okay. there is a, there is a problem in law firm that's talking about the legislator spending time on medical marijuana. Medical marijuana. Is, that, is there going to be any time wasted on that? Uh, well, it's got a long way to go, um, and the legislature won't spend any time on it until there's a, there's a constitutional initiative being, it's going before the Supreme Court for uh, review. They have to look at the language to make sure that it's single subject, that it doesn't, that the summary is right, blah, blah. There's a whole bunch of steps that have to happen. Um, the legislature is not going to touch that issue. They're not, it, if, if it gets passed by the citizens, then they're going to have to implement it, and then they'll do what they have to do. But, no. Uh, maybe an arcane question, but this recent year, uh, we got a property tax exemption passed for investments in renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And that has an effect on revenue stream prospectively mm -hmm. for a county or a city. Mm -hmm. Say somebody comes today and invests in a solar panel system, they don't get a property tax bond for that. Right. There are businesses that have, are taking the same position that says it would be helpful to uh, advanced renewable energy investment.
investments if we had some kind of an exemption or a deferral of application of property tax. Mm -hmm. What's the League of Cities position on that? Uh, is it established or are you still looking at it? We're still looking at it because it, there's, there's a lot of questions about it in terms of you know, what do you do if they sell the property. I mean, there's a whole lot. It, it, it is inside. That is a sort of an ultimate inside baseball. We are looking at it. I can tell you that a bunch of our members, I think citizens across the state in general, would say that we need to look at our energy portfolio and make sure that it's adequate for going in the future for jobs, for citizens, for everyone. For everyone. Lee is it, we're looking at it. It's, it's not something that we're, we don't have a knee-jerk reaction of yes or no. We're, we're studying it and our members will have it.